Well, today I'm feeling kind of old, uh, I, you know, and the reason for that is that we're going to talk about sex, and, um, you know, everybody's going to leave. I remember the first time I talked about, I mentioned that word uh, like 25 years ago in the pulpit, and I got in trouble. I mean, I, they didn't yell at me or anything, but they let me know that they thought that that kind of discussion or that word in a church service was inappropriate. You know, like I'd embarrass God or something, you know. <laughs> but uh, the precious little old ladies who were going, you know, like this, because I just simply said the word sex. You know, things have changed a lot, haven't they? Uh, you know, now uh, some churches I, I saw have billboards with, you know, two sets of feet sticking out of the blankets. And we're talking about sex at church to get crowds, you know. It's, it's like the church is going to teach us something about sex. I mean, we, uh, you sit in front of your TV and with your nice little family and watching a nice little show. And then all of a sudden there's, you know, there's those two bathtubs and they're talking about blood flow and, and going to the ER. And you're like, <laughs> how can we change it? You know, I hope they don't ask us any questions about what this is all about. But, but our culture is just inundated with this subject. And, you know, um, I kind of feel like the Old Testament prophet dude that's kind of coming out of the wilderness and going, repent, everybody, you know, listen to me today. Because the, the message that, that's in this passage from 1 Corinthians 6 sounds so weird in our culture. This is just like, what? You know, what, what in the world are you talking about? And, you know, it makes me feel old because I'm like, if I know too much about this, people are going to wonder why I would know too much about this. And yet, if I don't know something about this, then I'm just totally, you know, out of connection here. And so be gentle to me. You know, give me some smiles while I'm preaching here today. Um, I, I'm not real sure what to expect out of this. Uh, uh, the world and, and actually, you know, most of the church... Uh, thinks that what the Bible says about sex is just completely outdated. I mean, w what would God know about this? You know, like other people know about sex, and, and we have research scientists to find out, you know, what's really true here. We don't need some old-fashioned stuff in the Bible, you know, and that kind of thing. And, and uh, in, in our culture, we've just completely thrown off the chains of inhibition now. And... Um, you know, I think every generation feels that. And, but, but really, now the reality is, it's really just do what you want to do. And, and nobody can tell you that you're doing anything wrong there because we're, we're just like so liberated. And, uh, and yet, you know, I, I don't mind being the prophet for one Sunday and sounding weird because I, I think that there's really something here that we need to hear. And, and the first thing I'd like to start with is just to ask the question, you know, before we get into the Bible today, if we were just honest about the what we would call the sexual revolution or the liberation of America here, where, you know, nobody can say what you're doing with your own body, that anything's wrong there, I'd just like to ask the question, how, is this, how do you think this is working, just as Americans? If, if it wasn't, didn't have anything to do with the Bible, there weren't any oughts or shoulds in this, if we could just be kind of analytical here for a little bit and, and look at it, and say, how, do you th how is this working for your family? How is this working for your kids? You know, how is this working for your marriage uh, with the, these new norms? Are, are we better off than what we were? Are, you know, our marriage is better? Is there more uh, better mental health today? Um, less depression? Are we sleeping better now in, in 2013 than what we were, you know, 40 years ago? Um, what, what about drug use? All these things are related, you know. And I'd like for us just to step outside the, the oughts and the shoulds that we've we put on, on this from the Bible and just say, you know, how's this working? Is it good? And I, I don't think you really need a preacher to analyze this. And, you know, we can look at how things are and just say, well, it's not getting any better. It's not helping any, I don't think. I think it's making things worse. What's, what's going on, and much more complicated than what they were. And uh, 
we, we take this incredible gift of, of uh, intimacy and sex that God gives us and we take it out of the, the context that it's designed for and, you know, where it becomes an activity is what it is today. It's an event. It's, it's an activity. It's an event. It really has nothing to do with us. It's just something that we do is, is the way the world um, looks at it and you just kind of go with your heart and you go with your feelings or you go with your desires and you know kids will be kids and men will be men and women well they've got their needs too and so we just kind of go with that and you know it's in fact is you know well we even call it making love is what we call it we've been calling it that for some time like we can make that you know but this kind of physical activity does that and you, I don't think you need me to tell you this today that it's it's really not making things any better you know, if we could just take all the moral implications out of it and just look at it from a very practical standpoint, we'd say things are kind of going south here. And um, it's just really getting complicated. And it's, uh, you know, no one's going to say, well, you know, like a couple years ago, I remember, yeah, there was that night and I was at the bar and I had a little bit too much to drink and I went home with that guy. And, you know, no, you know, it, I don't know what his name was, but man, that just really enriched my life a lot. Right? Nobody's saying that because it isn't true. You just get outside the Bible and go, you know, that's, that's really kind of silly to think that this is going to be good for me. And we don't need a preacher to tell us that. We don't really need the Bible to tell us that sex is, is messing a lot of things up in America today. And, and millions of dads don't get to tuck their kids in at night because of sex. I mean, it's sad. Young women are abducted and sold into the sex slavery. And, and you know, stop and think about that, of, of people stealing a little girl and, and selling them for the rest of their lives or until they're all used up someplace. And, you know, we're going to say, well, it's just about sex. It's not hurting anybody. You, you know, you stop and think about it and, well, it's not working. We, we don't need God's word to tell us that America is in real trouble because of sex. Because there's so many people who are not free. So many people who are in chains and deep bondage. And I think if we would be honest with ourselves, we'd, we'd admit that it's complicated things a lot. At the very best. And, and destroyed a lot of things at the worst. And, I, you know, it'd be good if we just, as a culture, would just stop pretending about this. We're not going to because it's all about money. I mean, that's behind everything. But we're not going to stop pretending about this. Um, but it, w it would be good. We, and the reality for more, many people is that the decisions that they made when they were, you know, 16 or 18 or, or 21 or 25 or, you know, you were on spring break or you were at college and, and all this stuff, you know, when you're young. And th that stage in your life kind of leaks into the next stage and into the next stage. And... And just it's just not working. And almost, you know, you notice almost every big news story, almost every news story has some sexual entanglement in it. it it's, it's just in everything. And I thought about this. If you were God and you were looking down on America and you were looking at all this and you see all the young people selling themselves, I mean, little girls that run away from home and end up being prostitutes, they want to run away from a bad family and they end up having to sell their lives, you know, sell themselves for sex. And you'd look at, you know, people being abused by stepdads and uncles and, and the, all the disease and the divorce and the depression. Gosh, this is a depressing message. I'm so sorry. But, but it's true. If you, would, if you were God and you were looking down on that, what would you say? What, what, what would you say to America? I mean, would the message be, hey, be careful, you know, be safe. I want you folks to be safe now. Uh, and make sure you're ready. Because that's the only message that we're getting uh, from this in America right now is, is be careful, be safe. Make sure you're old enough, you know, on these, on these decisions that you're, that you're making. And I, if you were God and you were looking down on America and all the loneliness that people are 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 getting from this and, and all the the rejection and, and you were God and just for one moment you had everyone's attention what would you say it 
have to be the exact opposite of what we're hearing, isn't it? Wouldn't it have to be the exact opposite? The culture is going, man, it's just physical. It's just sex. This is nothing to this. It's not important. It's just fun. It's harmless, you know, just a physical act. And everyone's doing it. And God would say, I think God would give us a really old-fashioned message. This is why I feel so old, given this message. God would give us a very old-fashioned message, and he would say, he says, it's powerful. It's dangerous. Oh, and here's the shocker. It's for marriage. Wow. When was the last time we heard that in our culture? We don't hear that in our culture. And I can kind of see myself with a sign, you know, walking up and down Richmond Road, one of those nut guys with a big sign and with that message on it, sex is powerful and sex is dangerous and sex is for marriage. And, you know, the UK kids are driving in from Richmond in the morning and they're going down Richmond Road and they see that and they go, what in the world is, you know, it's like, and, and, you know, they go, I saw this crazy guy. I'm not going to do this. But I saw this crazy guy, and he was walking up and down Richmond Road, and it had some, I think there's a strip club coming in there on Richmond Road, because it had something to do with sex. And I think it's a strip club for married people, because it said sex is for married people, you know. But it's just like this, this message just misses us so far from what this is. Today, instead of going through verse by verse, we're going to jump around a little bit. So I actually printed, printed it in the bulletin. I didn't put any sermon notes in there. I think this is pretty clear this morning. But we're, uh, and I'm going to jump down to the end of 1 Corinthians 6 to begin with and give you verse 18 first. And, and just, just three words. He says, avoid sexual immorality. There's more to the verse than that, but we'll get the rest of it later. Avoid sexual immorality. And the translation here is just a little bit weak. The NIV says, uh, says, flee sexual immorality. And literally what this word that's translated in ours says avoid, and NIV says flee, says avoid with the purpose of escaping danger. Escape the danger of sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. Run away from it. Don't play around with it. Don't try it out. Don't experiment with it. Flee from it. Run away with. Run away from from it. Is is what he says. And and you know, America today, we hear that and we go immoral. Well, I don't, I don't see anything immoral about what I'm doing. I mean. Immoral is like what really bad people do. Immoral is like what politicians do. Immoral is what really rich people do that abuse other people, but I'm not immoral. You know, there, there was that time I was in Vegas, I know, you know, but gosh, we were drunk. We were all drunk. And, and she does that all the time. That's her living, right? That's not immoral. It's not like I've got a bad heart, right? It's, it's, it's not like something in me is, is bad and, you know, it was just that one time. But what we do is we redefine the word. Immoral is what someone else does. It's not me because I'm basically a good person. So I can't do anything that's immoral. I'm not immoral. We talked about this briefly last week. When the Bible says sexual immorality, it's very specific what it's talking about. It means every sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant. Oh, man, he's like, that's unbelievable, Don. They can't mean that. I mean, that's so narrow, that's so judgmental, that's so small, because I'm not married now, right? Or I'm married and I don't want to be married. Uh, it's a huge word, and, and we may not be ready to accept that, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm just saying. That's what it means. It's every sexual activity outside of the marriage covenant. So. When it says run away from all sexual immorality, that's what it's saying is run away from all sexual activity outside the marriage covenant. And we'd like to put that through the filter and kind of translate that and say avoid everything that makes us feel bad. Okay? Avoid everything that might hurt us. Avoid people that aren't like us or don't like us or stay away from weird people is what we want to translate that. But the Bible is very specific. It says run away from all sex outside of marriage. And people you know, they hear that and they snicker and they go, this is, this is a new world, man. You, you, you're just not, I don't know what planet you come off of. Things have changed. 
you know, that may have been okay for you old guys way back there in the 50s and 60s and stuff like that. But for us, I mean, we, we, we eat with utensils now. I mean, we don't ride donkeys most days. Not like those Bible people. That's, that's just so out of touch. Nobody's going to hear that. Nobody, nobody's going to take that seriously. This is impossible. This is not necessary is what they're going to say. And we say that kind of stuff because we don't know what the Bible says can happen. I mean, we're really pretty illiterate on this. And those words were first written, remember, to the Corinthians. Uh, these new Christians that Paul has started this church in Corinth, and they were brand new Christians, and it's a wild city, it's a port city. Uh, thousands and thousands of people come through here. This is vacation, this is Vegas, and then, you know, what happens in Corinth stays in Corinth kind of thing. And, and they're going through there, and, and, and there's temples. Get this. There's temples with prostitutes. You know, we get upset in the church when we have drums and a video. We're, we're talking about prostitutes in the pagan temples. And it was all part of this pagan worship of, of what they did. These people in Corinth had been involved in that. Some of them are still involved in this. So if we think that our culture is just a little bit beyond that, now this is right where we are. I mean, the, these, these new Christians were not raised in Sunday school. That's what they were coming out of. That's, where they, that's what they once were just, just two years ago. And then, and then they were converted and they came to Christ. So, so earlier in the chapter, Paul just lists a few things that they did. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. He says, don't you know that people who are unjust won't inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived. Boy, there's a sermon. Don't be deceived. <laughs> Those who are sexually immoral, same word again. Those who worship false gods, adulterers, both participants in same-sex intercourse, thieves, the greedy, drunks, abusive people, swindlers, won't inherit God's kingdom. Then verse 11, he says, that's what some of you used to be, but you were washed clean. You were made holy to God. You were made right with God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of God. Now guys, you know, if you hear nothing else today, I, I want you desperately to hear verse 11. That is what some of you used to be. Isn't that a great phrase? You know, that's what some of you used to be. And then God got a hold of you, and he washed your life, and he made you holy, and he put you right with God, is what he said. These, these are the people you used to be. God changes lives. God transforms lives. And the truth is that sexual immorality is so powerful. The root of it is so powerful uh, physiologically and, and psychologically in us that it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to set us free. You know, we can try and we can try, but unless God does it, you're not going to get there. And that's what God does. God takes people who have been going to the temple prostitutes, and he turns them into the church leaders. Wow. Isn't that huge? So don't, don't miss that today. See, he says, you're born again. You're a new creation. The old things are gone. God says, that's what you were. And now this is who you are. You were a person that went to the temple prostitutes. Now you've been washed clean. Now you've been made new. Now you've been put right with Jesus Christ. So whatever you do, don't, don't mention or miss any of that. Now back to verse 18. He says, avoid sexual immorality. Every sin that a person can do is committed outside the body, except those who engage in sexual immorality commit sin against their own bodies. Leave that up for, for a little bit. It's, you know, sexual sin, he says, is different. This, this is not like everything else. Uh, this is different. This is much more dangerous than those other things. This is, this is an action against ourselves. And, I mean, that's weird, isn't it? He says, th this, one, this one area, you know, this isn't like everything else that you do. This is different than everything else because this action isn't just against God. This is against yourself. And, I mean, we think, no, no, this is just me. This is what I want to do. This is my desire. This is for my heart. I need this love. You know, this is what I get. And, you know, if it doesn't hurt anybody else... And he says, no, these things are in a category all by themselves. And it isn't that just God gets, you know, upset about this. He says, no, this, this really is about you. This is the way they impact us. 
And it comes to this, I always think of, of the illustration of fire. Because I think fire just kind of illustrates what this is. Um, you know, when we go camping, the first thing that we do is we pick out a nice campsite, and the very first thing that we do, once we decide where the tents are going, is where the fire is going to be, and we go get to the wood and we start building a fire. Because everybody's got, you got to have a fire if you're going camping, right? That's why you go camping, is to have a fire. So you can sit there and mess with it all night, and there's something that's just really, you know, soothing to the soul. It's like going to the beach. It's kind of, it's, it's to sit in front of the fire and watch the fire all night. And of course, we're always very sure that when we leave, the fire is completely out, right? That, that nothing can happen. But we contain the fire. We, we don't take some of the logs and throw them out in the woods and say, I wonder what that'll do out there. Let's spread the fire around, right? We'd have a mess. That's what they're finding out in California. After a month, they're still fighting the same fire. When fire is not contained, it gets very dangerous. It spreads. It hurts people. I was a little kid. I loved to play with fire. Some of you did, too. It's so exciting. Uh, lived on a farm. My dad had, catch this, this is how silly people were back then. He had a 55-gallon barrel of kerosene that was behind one of the sheds that I could go to any time I wanted and get a can of kerosene and burn stuff. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, I know he stopped thinking about that now. Go, what kind of parents raised him? But you could. You could take a can of kerosene and you could go out and make a little stream, you know. Boom, oh, that's neat. You had kitchen matches. Boom, like that. Isn't that fun? Woolly worms this time of year. Oh, little woolly worm dance. Look at him go, you know. Fun. That's, yeah, Lord forgive me. That's the kind of stuff that we did on a farm. Dad's in the field, mom's at school. You know, burn some things, right? <laughs> Sex is a lot like fire. When it's contained, it's fantastic. I mean, it's the greatest thing invented. But when we abuse it, when we, we get it outside its container and say, it's good there to be better over here, you know, it's going to burn you is what's going to happen. It becomes very dangerous and destructive. And why? Because sex has a spiritual dimension to it. It's not just physical. This is what the world doesn't know. There's a spiritual dimension to this. God created the whole thing. God piled some wood up there in the Garden of Eden, and he got out his can of kerosene and poured the kerosene on the wood, and the angels are standing around. He says, watch this. Boom. They go, wow. Never seen anything like that. We've seen the planets and we've seen the stars, but man, that's really something what you just invented there, God. And he said, yeah, it's just for them. You see? It's, it's for the man and the woman is who it's for. <laughs> Let's go on. Verse 15. He says, don't you know that your bodies are parts of Christ? So then should I take parts of Christ and make them part of someone who is sleeping around? No way. And the word sleeping around there is really prostitute in a lot of the other translations. Now, now here there's this huge disconnect. Uh, we're getting further and further disconnected, I think. The idea is that our physical bodies represent God. Most people think that God's confined to our heart. You know, I've got, I've got this growing pet peeve now as the evangelical community, of which I'm a part, says invite Jesus into your heart. Let's not invite Jesus into our heart. Let's invite him into all of us, okay? Well, let's not just say, okay, you've got my heart. You've got my soul. But how about my whole body? You know, you know this, this teaching that, that we are, uh, the heart is just God's and the body is the devil's, th th this is of the devil. Nowhere in Scripture does it teach this. It teaches us that we are a unified person. Our body, our soul, it's all together. And God inhabits all of us. That's what, you know, Jesus said, that we will come and make our home in you. He didn't just mean in our hearts, like we could separate that out. I'm going to make, make my home in all of your body, all of you, you know. So when we say, I have the Holy Spirit, uh, he's in my heart, he's in my soul, but he's also in my body. Uh, and and the, the world and a lot of Christians, they, they, and the Corinthians were doing the same thing. They want to separate those two, and they think, I can do anything with my body because that doesn't have anything to do with God. That's where they were. And, and qu quite honestly, in the church today, there's a lot of people that live like that. They may not say that, but that's the way they're living, is that, well, that's just a physical thing. 
okay? And that doesn't have anything with God. I, you know, my heart is still God's, but my body, well, I do what I want with my body because it doesn't make any difference. God says, you don't understand how I made you. You are one, all right? You can't subdivide the person around and say, well, this, this doesn't make any difference because this isn't God's. I made you. I, he says, trust me, I know how I made you. What you do with your body is going to mess with your soul. What you do with your soul is going to mess with your body. You're an integrated person. You, you are united here. And he says, when you join with someone else who is sleeping around, you're making me a part of that is what you're doing. You, you, you can't leave me at home and go out and party, guys. You're taking me with you. Verse 16 says, don't you know that anyone who is joined to someone who is sleeping around is one body with that person? The scripture says the two will become one flesh. The one who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So here Paul quotes Genesis 2. And Genesis 2 and, you know, kind of God's account of putting, putting kerosene on the wood and striking the match. And he does this to explain to us a reality about sex that, that we already know this from experience. This, this is not new to us. But maybe we've never heard it spoken so we can actually, you know, uh, own this thing. But he says that sex is different bond from all other bonds. He says it makes two people one. He says we're joined. The audience says, whoa, man, uh, you know, wait, you lost me there. You, you got me on two people becoming one. We're not joining. I don't even love this person. We're not uniting. I, I don't even know her name. I mean, it's just sex. It's just physical. It didn't mean anything. It's just purely physical. It was spring break or it was a party or it was one night and we're not in love. And God's saying there's no such thing. There's no such thing. Uh, sex is never just physical. The way I made you, I made you so special. I made, made this to be so intimate, so powerful. It, that is, it's more than physical. You can't just do something with your body without your entire person being involved. And the word translated here is joined. It's also meant to attach or glue. And I think we need to pay attention to that concept. You glue two things together and you try to get them apart, they're both going to tear, right? It never comes apart the way that you put it together. So he says you're, you're, you're joining with someone, you're gluing with someone else, and, and when, when that breaks, okay, you're going to leave part of yourself there and you're going to take part of that person with you. We get glued to them, and like any time that we glue things together, okay, there's going to be some hurt when we try to separate them. Way back in the old days, we only had Chuck's Converse. We, we didn't have high tops. Okay? Way, way back then. They just invented basketball and rubber and stuff like that when I was playing. <laughs> but, but right before the game started, you know, the managers would come around, they'd tape up your ankles. And you had to shave your ankles. <laughs> Guys always did that in private. Now they do it publicly, but we did that in private. But anyway, you'd shave your ankle. And if the manager was kind of mean, he'd tape you high. And that meant when you go to take the tape off, uh, that's how waxing was invented. It was way back there in the junior high locker room, you know, was he'd take the tape off and here'd come a whole bunch of hair with it. But it's ouch, you know, it went on easy. It comes off not so easy. So, you know, we need to remember that. that I said, man, did that hurt. More than likely, we've experienced that at some time. We want to forget it. We want to move on. We want to treat it like it was just physical, but we're missing some part of ourselves. Okay? Because what God says is true. We joined with that person. It tore. It stuck. And like it or not, we become one of them. And here's the reality so many people just don't get. There's a oneness, and you can never completely unone something. Once there's a oneness, you can never completely unone it. You can rip it apart, but you leave a little bit there. You take a little bit with you. And, I mean, have you ever heard that in our culture? No. We're never going to hear that in our culture. Absolutely not. The culture tells us that, he says, just don't get, don't get caught. There's no harm. There's no disease. And God says, a little bit of you stays there, all right? So if you're going to a lot of different people, you're getting left in a lot of different places, and you're bringing a whole lot with you. Sadly, I think this topic hits us all. Uh, I don't think anybody comes 
uh, clean to this. I, I think somebody had, we all have some kind of experience here and we find ourselves, maybe we didn't know better, maybe we we're like the Corinthians where he says, do not be deceived. Um, maybe it was someone's power over us that uh, you know took something from us. But you know, I want to turn this right here because this is kind of heavy, right? And I, I want to turn this just a little bit and give you a good word. We put up our second sign up here today and it says, you know, I am a temple. We started off there three weeks ago with we are a temple and talking to him where, where Paul did that in the third chapter. Now he says that you individuals are a, are a temple. Uh, verse 19, he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? But don't you know that you have the Holy Spirit from God and you don't belong to yourselves? You have been bought and paid for, so honor God with your body. God, God says, you're a temple. Each one of you, your temple. When Jesus was crucified, what this comes from, when Jesus was crucified, the Holy of Holies in the temple there on the Temple Mount, the, the, the curtain, the long curtain, is, I think it's about 40 feet tall, was, was ripped from top to bottom when he died. Earthquake went through the temple. And we look at that and we go, wow, is that letting us in to the Holy of Holies or is it letting God out of the Holy of Holies? And I don't really think it makes any difference which way you're going to look at that. I mean, the reality is, is that at that, that, that time was over where there's this physical temple. Now God says, I'm going to be a temple inside of every one of you. See, every place that you go, you're going to bring, take God with you. Not just in your heart, but in your body too. And that, that old temple is just kind of a picture of the new temple. And, and God would make his home in each one of us. And we become his holy place. We become his temple. And he meets us here. I, it shouldn't go like this because you think I'm meaning heart. No, he meets us here. And it says that Jesus paid the price. Jesus bought us with his blood. And, you know... Don't let that push you down. Don't, don't, you know, we hear this a lot of times. We go, man, I'm a terrible temple. I'm just a rotten temple, you know, and, and I can't believe what I've done. Don't let that push you down there, okay? Repent from that. Get, get past that. I want this to lift you up because this is what he's doing with this. He's saying, no, you're not just physical. You're a temple. I'm living in you. I mean, can you get that? God raises us up who he calls us to be. He calls us up to be his reps, his containers. He says, I want to live in you. He speaks these words to the same people who had been going to the prostitutes and saying there's nothing wrong with it. He says, I, they, they were saying, I can do anything I want. And, and God says to them, you're my temples. My Holy Spirit's living in you. He says, no, you're, you're so much more than that. And they say, I, I don't feel like it, you know. Don, today, I just don't feel like I'm a temple. Well, you need some word in you. This is what he's saying to us. He's saying, this is who you are. If you're in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is who you are. I mean, maybe there's some ripping off. Maybe there's some places of us left. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, not, none of us come here without something from the past. So, you know, if, if we're coming here today and, and there's... There's been some pieces of it that's been torn off, and, and maybe we've done it, maybe somebody else has done it. I, I don't know, but if you've, if you've repented of that, then I want you to stand. You know, I want you to stand and, and be temples. You know, you're going to live the way that you think that you are. If you think that you're a garbage can, you're going to live like a garbage can. If you'll receive the reality that you're a temple of God, you're going to live like a temple of God. That's how you're going to live. So maybe we've been deceived. Maybe we need to turn. Maybe we need to repent. I want to help you do that today. Um, this is a very powerful area in life. The strongholds here are huge. And maybe you've been playing with the fire. Maybe you've got the kerosene and the matches in the backyard, so to speak. And God says, you need to put them down, okay? You need to get rid of your kerosene. You need to get rid of your matches. You, you, need to, you need to stand firm here. And so, you know, if, if you're saying, well, okay, I, I hear what you're saying. Maybe some of you are going, I don't know yet. I'm hearing this and it just sounds weird. And I'm thinking about what I've been doing and I'm thinking about, you know, how hard this is for me. And I, I don't see how I can walk into that. 
all right? I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you, would you pray about it? Would you go home and just pray about it? Would you just talk to God about it and say, Lord, you know, I've been hearing some strange things about what you want out of my life. Lord, would you teach me some more? Would you, would, would you be kind to me and continue to instruct me? And some of us maybe, you know, if you're saying, okay, uh, God's been telling me that, and, and I, you're not the first person to talk about this, and this has been kind of an extreme because that's the way the Holy Spirit does things. Today I want you to put a flag down, so to speak. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we come to the table today, but I want you to put a flag down. And, you know, when we say we're going to stake out a flag and say that's who I am and that's where I'm standing and I hear what God's calling me to, and to put a flag down, you're going to have to tell somebody. You, you can't keep this a secret. You've got to tell somebody. And I hope you got somebody to tell. I really do. But, but you need to tell somebody and say, okay, I, I've been deceived, and, and I, I, there's pieces of me missing, okay? And um, I want to turn from that. So let's, let's start in a time of prayer here and let the Holy Spirit uh, continue to teach us, and then uh, we'll take up our offering and come to the table. As deep cries out 